Greetings, everyone. This is Rock and Roll Spot Connection with the Weekly Comic Book Roundup. And we're going to get started on this week's X-Men books, Spider-Man books, and Avengers book. Kick things off with Cable number two. When we left off in Cable number one, <coughs> Cable had, uh, well, Cable apparently found himself a space sword on one of the beasts on the other, on the Arco side of, of the island, of the combined Krakoa Arco island. Um, turns out that sword was in fact the, the blade of one of the, of one of the Space Knights of Galador. And three of the Space Knights across the galaxy in a museum woke up, were react. Basically, they, they, they're robots, so, you know, like I said, they woke up and then uh, left the museum and headed towards Earth to get the sword. Also, in another dimension, maybe, a few timeline, an older cable, basically the cable we all know and love, is hunting something, or, well, hunting hostages. Trying to find some hostages that have been taken. And so, we have that going on, too. And so we begin with, uh, the issue begins, two mutant, well, a couple, Omerta and Stinger. Uh, Omerta, a former mutant, Stinger, still a mutant, married with, with a mutant child, arguing about going to Krakoa. Um... Omerta's not exactly, you know, digging the idea, um, because, you know, who knows how easily it would be for them to move back if they wanted to. You know, would they have to renounce their citizenship? Plus, she doesn't, he, plus he doesn't have his powers anymore. And Omerta also brings up a very valid point that, you know... I think everyone needs to be brought up constantly, both concerning the, story, the overall story since House of X number one and, you know, Donna onward, that the last time there was, you know, there was a mutant homeland, millions of mutants were murdered by Sentinels. So he's kind of saying, you know, Let's wait and see how how Krakoa does. You know, it's, it's not like it's an early bird special. Singer um, kind of brings up though. You know, why are they struggling with to pay every bill in the world? Mortgage, insurance, America's parents' health care, auto, food—it's just too much. And you know, and. Stinger goes off to check on their baby and says, you know, she's maybe a little sick of turning every head when she goes out because, I mean, Omer doesn't see those, since he apparently doesn't have his powers anymore, passes, looks like a normal human. When she looks in on her child, though, baby's gone. Crib's empty. And we get a, uh, we see a Daily Bugle uh, headline saying, Muty Cutie Stolen. So, um, we cut to Cable, what appears to be an interrogation room, explaining that a mutant baby has been ripped from his parents' arms on human soil. That's a crime that threatens to become an international incident. So he asks, what are we going to do about it? The two cops basically, you know, kind of have a, you know, explain that they're only taking the meeting because the death sergeant said that uh, Cable's face was all messed up and asked what's going on with Cable's eye. His partner also asked Cable how old Cable is, to which he respond, replies he's old enough. Um, it's all... Basically, Cable's told, you know, hey, we're investigating, we take, you know, 
we take this seriously, regardless, of, you know, we take the, ki the kidnapping of a baby seriously, regardless of whether or not the baby's white, yellow, or white, black, yellow, brown, or mutant. And Cable's probably told to stay out of, stay out of the, the way of the cops. And so, that night with, with Esme, with Esme Cuckoo, um, As me and Cable discuss the fact that uh, apparently Cable's dating all five of the cuckoos. And um, apparently he Cable broke Celeste into the Louvre after hours and then took her to a restaurant with two Michelin stars. Cable claims it tasted like it only had one. And also Cable totally lies to Esme telling her that uh, the cops were apparently totally, were really stoked that he was willing to consult. So, Esme uses her telepathy to, you know, check out the, uh, see what she can get off the neighbors. It's funny that the people in the house across the street weren't home when the baby went missing. The next door to them know nothing, but they're scared. Because they, they like American Stinger. The two of them kiss and then, uh. The cop goes by and asks Cable and Esme how the investigation is going and tells them to keep up the good work. And Cable asks, you know, what are the rest of the cookies doing when he's with just one of them? And Esme tells him that they do their own things. After all, Cable's not that interesting. She asks if, if he's worried they're constantly judging him, and he says he, to he says that he's not afraid of it, but. By the way, yeah, he, he's afraid of that. Back with the rest of the cuckoos, one of them explains that uh, they're going to dan dance a jig on poor bo on Nathan's poor broken heart. And one of the others said, says that there are other telepaths that might be more interesting on the island. Back with Back with Cable and Esme. <clears throat> Esme points out that the people in uh, one of the houses were there earlier and then left suddenly. They were doing weird chants in white robes and then a screaming baby showed up and they all left. Cable figures it must be the Order of X. Esme turns diamond, smashes open the door, and turns out that the house wasn't completely empty. As there was a dog present that now is who's now free to leave. Cable goes in, sword drawn, and uh, three space knights detect this and head towards it. Basically arriving and destroying the house. Their, their primary target is clearly Cable, but yeah, they, they do want to do what they can to, you know. To make sure that uh, Esme has their problem as well. Um, the three Space Knights leave, bringing, taking Cable and Esme with them. Mainly because one of the Space Knights wants to know just how the greatest weapon up how Gallagher's greatest weapon ended up in their in their hands. Next we cut to Cyclops, arriving to speak with the same cops that Cable spoke with. Um, they ask if Cable's still missing, and well, Scott is, is not surprised that 
cables on the case. Cox explained that uh, there's no case for the X-Men. It's their case. It's the Philadelphia PD's case. And, you know, guy compliments uh, Scott, or, or compliments Nathan. He says, you know, yeah, you a little bossy. And, he's out, and he doesn't know what's going on with, the, with Cable's eye, and obviously it runs the family. You know, no offense. You know, the other cop basically tells Scott, you know, let us do our job. Then welcome to Philly. Treat yourself to a cheesecake before you walk through. There's a wedding gazebo thing that you guys planted all over the place. And, well, having a cheesecake is exactly what, uh... Cyclops does. When Emma shows up, it looks like they're at, uh, he's at the summer house and this is going on. Emma shows up asking if uh, Scott knows what his young Nathan is up to. And yeah, basically, yeah, okay, you know, which one is, okay, which of the cuckoos is he seeing? And Emma explains he's seeing all of them. Apparently Celeste couldn't wait to tell her. Cyclops defends say, defends this, say, you know, the six of them are old and not, or, you know, adults-ish. Emma explains that she expects a certain, some, a certain amount of tackiness from some of her girls, but not all of them. And she expects Cable to be a gentleman. And that, uh, apparently, he is not to break their hearts. Except Esme, because she needs it. And so, Scott says that he'll add that to the list of things that uh, Cable and here are going to chat about. We have an email transcript from uh, Melina and DeStefano, the two uh, officers investigating the... Uh, the kidnap the baby kidnapping. First one. Hey boss, busy day. We got a visit from the mutants and we were going going over the list of the enemy the enemy's list of the parents. It's hilarious. We can't miss the neighbors, most were long term owners or renters. There's one house that the neighbors unanimously speak some stink side eye at. Turns out one of the houses within sight of the crime scene was rented to a guy who might have been one of the new cults that sprung up. He was seen throwing pajama parties and the like, and now they're suddenly gone. We're gonna get a warrant and search that rental rental house tonight with the crime scene guys. And a response to that from uh, basically an addition: the house got blown up. I guess we're gonna need to haul those crack ones back. Any idea how to do that? Then we cut back to the hunt. Entry 002. The isolation is hard. If it weren't for the chronometer chronometer in my arm, I wouldn't have the slightest notion of how long I've been locked away in this place. I know what I'm doing is vitally important and why I have to go it alone, but it's still difficult. Sometimes I talk to the dog, it never returns the favor. I cleared one hole after the other, and although I'm making progress breaking up the Legion of Demons, I ran frust frustratingly behind. The only good news is that I haven't found any evidence the hostages have been harmed. I kept up with the markers on the ground. If I go down and this book is found, then anyone following my footsteps should continue in the direction of the dog star in the sky. The stars are backwards here, but you can make sense of them after your eyes adjust. I had the bathrooms on the run, and I'm proceeding at best possible pace. My thoughts are loud in my head now, but I try to relax and breathe and think of the better times that are sure to follow after I manage to walk out of this quiet hell. And so Cable is uh, on his mount with a uh, enslaved demon. Who expl the demon explains that the spire is, lies just beyond the valley. He then um, says to Cable, you know, don't worry. I, you know, apparently he's done what Cable lasts, and if, his, if the demon's master sees sees the demon leading Cable to him, well, he'll pull the demon apart piece by piece and, and make Cable beg for a death that, he will, that he'll deny you. So, Cable shoots the demon in the head. Moves, goes on forward and sees the spire. Which is very clearly an obvious trap. Looks a bit like a certain uh, state building. 
Oh, okay, yes. The Empire State Building. And that is where the issue ends. Which brings us to... X-Men Fantastic Four, number two. Where we left off... Franklin Richards, Valeria Richards, Kate Pride, and a handful of other X-Men were on a an annexed island or, or, on an island annexed by by Latveria that was home to Latveria mutant. It was also home to Latveria's mutant population, but they discovered that there was something. Well, a bit sinister going on. Namely, it seemed that Doom was building Sentinels. Also, well, the Fantastic Four and the X-Men came to blows because <laughs> Franklin ran away. Franklin and Valeria ran away with the Marauders. But the two decided to, to at least somewhat work together to get them back from Doom. <clears throat> Um, there's an explosion outside, and, and the gathered scientific minds, as well as Sue Storm, are wondering what's going on. But Doom explains that, uh... Oh, wait, it's not Sue that asks, it's, uh, Valeria. Of course, Uncle Doom. Basically, explaining that the, uh... X-Men killed a Latvarian mutant. Hank and Reed look out the window and see the Latvarian Sentinel, Doom, Doombot Sentinels, going up against the X-Men. And Reed asks what Doom's done, while B simply says that uh, Doom's declared war on, war on mutants. So the X-Men and the Fantastic Four are dealing with the uh, Doom Sentinels outside. Invisible Woman arrives, trying to, trying to help her son. Then Kate faces through the force field that uh, Doom set up. Takes some effort, but she can do it. And then Doom explains that uh, apparently he knows her powers better than she, even better than she does. Explaining that. Uh, Kate can make herself lighter than air, so why not heavier than stone? Which, side, side note, was something that uh, Ultimate, Shadow, Ultimate Kitty Pride was able to do uh, rather effectively. Um, back, uh, there was a brief period in Ultimate Spider-Man where she was running around as the Shroud, and... Uh, She would, uh, she could appear, just seemingly appear and disappear at will, phasing, th phasing her way out of things, or bust through things because you know, yeah, basically. So it was, it's actually kind of neat that someone actually said, "Hey, Ultimate Kitty Pride can do this. Why can't regular Kitty Pride?" Franklin asked for Doom to leave everyone alone, and uh, Doom chides him because, well, Doom. That Doom explains that no one has Franklin's interests at heart. Xavier and his nation of betters want, simply want Franklin's power. His family, Franklin's family wants Franklin to stay a child. Emma manages to get in touch with uh, Invisible Woman telepathically. Great strain with Doom's tele telepathy dampeners. And to explain that the Missing mutants are trapped in automated doom armor. They can't get through, and the X Men can't get through without harming them. Uh, so, Reed and Sue have a moment. Reed basically, you know, go save everyone.
but they're going to coordinate with uh, Emma, Cyclops, Sue Storm, or well, Sue Richards, and Nightcrawler. And we're going to do what they can to get mutants out of the armor. And Nightcrawler states, asks, isn't it grand when they come together and fight evil? Opining that this must, must be what the Avengers feel like when they constantly reform. And so, Doom continues his process with Franklin. So it, the pro, it will soon be over and he will be whole. Uh, both both Reed and Charles, you know, were trying, basically, you know, you don't have to go through with this. It's very, it's clear that Doom's got ulterior motives. And then, Kate returns, phases through Doom's armor, briefly shorting it. And then he, she asks Franklin, what is it that he wants? He kind of wants to go to his mom. So, Kate phases him out of his suit, gets him out of the, out of the castle, and all the Doombots explode. Doom is, of course, pissed, explaining that Franklin may be irreparably damaged from halting Doom's immaculate process. And Franklin is as foolhardy as his father. However, it's a hologram that's that's taunting the X Men and the Fantastic Four. And uh, of course, Doom accuses them of uh, breaking laws with their intolerable superiority. Doom's conditions were ignored, trespassing, and he, they trespassed among their citizens, murdering a librarian mutant whom he was protecting. Also, it's explain. You know, Doom, of course, chased at the idea of his, uh, the robots being compared to Sentinels, explain that it, his, uh, Latviathans make no distinction between mutant and human. They protect Latveria. Doom also says them, you know, it would be wise for the, the gathered heroes to leave before he brings us to the international community. Charles says that they are leaving, but with the Latverian mutants. Going on to add that Doom's story is as hollow as his armor, or as hollow as his armor that, he, that uh, Doom trapped the mutants in. Their minds had been tampered with, their freedoms limited. Doom planned it. That the death is on his, on his hands, and there will be no more. They are crack home. As the hologram vanishes, Doom says, "So be it." And perhaps these not very mutants will show the crack home some light, very common sense. Um, Frank explains that. His powers are still broken, and apparently everything feels broken. He apologized, you know, basically, he, you know, he shouldn't have run off like he did. But they just didn't listen. You know, kind of go adding, you know, the F have taken, you know, Franklin and, Val and Valeria to the universe through the multiverse and show them amazing things in dangerous situations. You know, they. They spent their they spent their lives preparing Franklin to go out into the world to learn, and now he wants to learn about himself. They want to talk to him about it. And so Sue kind of explains that uh, you know her and Reed are, are proud of him, and the man he's becoming, and it's it's hard for and explains it's hard for them to accept that he's not their little boy anymore.
And she apologizes for reacting the way she did to Charles. Though Charles says, hey, you know, he could have been more tactful in offering Frank on, on, on Krakoa. You know, they see the concerns, and they know that uh, the Richard's home is a fine, it's a fine one for a young mutant. And but it is also an opportunity for him to learn about his people and his future. And with the gates, he will only be steps away. We also get a, uh, a write-up on the Krakoan Gates, courtesy of Reed Richards, explaining that he can't pinpoint a total. Krakoan Gates have emerged in most of the major cities on Earth. They allow instantaneous travel between gates and appear to be extremely resilient. They're remarkable on every level, and he can't help but wonder how these gates could, would change the world if Krakow would allow the other 99.9% of the world's population, humans, to use them. The drastic re reduction in carbon emissions alone would entirely halt global warming. The gates themselves fascinate Richards. Uh, he's documented wormholes that occur naturally, but rarely have he, has he seen ones formed by organic matter with a psychic connection. He, from studying the gate in Washington Square Park, he can ascertain that it's stable and emits no radiation. So if Franklin is continuing with his Krakow re residency, Reed sees no, harmful, no, no potential for harm, provided Krakoa, a sentient island, allows it. So we fast forward to three weeks later. Um, Beast is working with Franklin to try and figure out just, you know, trying to figure out what's going on with his powers. Apparently, however, when he uses his powers on uh, Krakoa, it doesn't, it doesn't deplete as quickly. But he's got to head, home, head back home for dinner, and Charles and Megiddo were wish to join him on the way. They had business in New York. And Charles thinks it would be good to, t to check in with Reed and Sue. Back at 40 Yancey Street, Valeria is talking with uh, her Uncle Doom. And she explains that uh, she checked out the actual suit that weren't in the schematics, siphoning off some of the power, siphoning off some of the power for himself, and sending a micro probe through the open conduit. So she asks what her uncle Doom was up to. Doom explains that war is in the air, and he will do what he must to ensure that Varia stands ready to embrace the next step in evolution. Valeri asks if that means embrace mutants, and Doom explains that uh, evolution is a response to environment. Common sense would dictate that it is our intelligence that must evolve, not our physical bodies. And he believes that uh, she and him are, are examples of that. But the environment is not challenging enough now to spark that growth. So nature gave, gave the planet mutants to galvanize the human race, to push us to be smarter, to evolve. And Doom intends to do just that. She, Valeria adds that uh, she thinks he needs to move on to acceptance and stages of grief over the death, over the death of humans. And then says, says goodbye to Uncle Doom as it is dinner time. And so... Franklin, Charles, and Eric show up at 4 Yancey Street, asking how, you know, and of course Sue asks how things are going there, while uh, Charles and Eric want to speak with Reed. Of course, he's in his lab, so. And... Magneto kind of cuts through things, basically saying they wanted to talk to him about the mutant gene device that he had, that basically masked Franklin's mutant gene. And Reed admits that, uh, apologizes for doing that, and, it, and 
Then Missy, it was wrong. Charles explains, they're not here for his apologies. Going on to add that um, not only does it hot, not only can it, can it hide the mutant gene, but it can also cut the gene off, denying mutant their abilities. And so Charles removed, removes, I should say, the. Uh, Reed's ability to ever remake the device. Adding that uh, back when, he, when Charles and Reed were part of the Illuminati, there would be one more step taken after this, erasing Reed's memory of this, of, of him doing, of Charles were doing this to him. Now Charles wants him to remember. That to, to the mutants, this is not a game. It's their right to survive. Magneto adding that uh, Reed doesn't get to do what he wants anymore. His wild, unchecked actions are now being checked. And he... And the two of them leave. We then get... Uh, we see the entry on the, uh, the Code X, as Reed called it, which cloaked Franklin's genes, or mutant genes. The first entry is how it was before Reed's talk with Charles. Then, shortly thereafter, with quite a bit of uh, words missing, as well as parts of the, of the picture, of the diagrams, and then the third version. Nothing. And that is where the story, the issue ends, as well as the miniseries. Very interesting. And of course, Doom was up to no good. Shock, amazement. Next up, we've got Symbiote Spider Man Alien Reality number five. So. When it comes to the where we left off, I'm really just going to read the, uh, well, actually, no, I'm not, because, uh, yeah, they don't do a normal one. So, Spider-Man, back in the Black Cop, Black, back in the Black Costume Saga, Spider-Man fi has found himself in an, in an altered version of reality, where his Uncle Ben was, is still alive. He's dating Natasha Romanoff, the Red Cat, and Hobgoblin is the Sorcerer Supreme. Oh, and Craven the Hunter is also a longtime ally of Spidey rather than a, uh, a foe. But yeah, um, however, he remembers how things are supposed to be, and so he gets, uh, they find Stephen Strange, and they, uh, they're working on fixing things. Apparently, though, the whole thing boils, centers around around a book which is basically the Word of God. Capital G, God. Um, our heroes, however, found themselves in the Nightmare Realm. And it turns out that Baron Mordo, who's been manipulating events from behind, from behind the scenes with the aid of uh, or, uh, basically utilizing Hobgoblin as muscle, well, he's destroyed the book. So, but uh, nightmares. Yeah, you know, it's the word of God. Big deal. It can be destroyed. We bring up a really interesting point. How many people have lost belief in spiritual leaders? How many people believe God has abandoned them and thusly abandoned their religion? Faith is the antithesis of reason. Give it any true thought, and it flitters away like an errant butterfly. But, uh... 
Strange further explains that Moro didn't just destroy the Word of God, he undid it. He used it to rewrite history one final time and wipe his own existence out of reality so that it could, was never described in the first place. Spider-Man then says, so he basically he retconned it. But Spidey has an idea. Kind of, you know, basically thinking in a more, thinking less like a scientist than Spider-Man usually does, and says, okay, so humanity is made in God's image. That's according to Genesis 1, 20, Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. So then the word of God is in the mind of humanity. Even if it's gone, it's still there. It's in mankind's imagination, and that which can't be retconned away. And, and Spider-Man and Doctor Strange right now are in the realm of humanity's dreams. Ground zero for imagination. And so Strange wonders, you know, they're, they're in a unique position to access, access what, what they need to recreate the Word of God. So... Strange insists that Spider-Man meditate. Um, basically, go beyond himself and lock into the world around him. Feel the emotions and sensations, the dreams of all of humanity. Tap into that and become one with it. His soul and theirs are merging with each other. He says that's quite rather unexpected, and so now... Spidey's going off with uh, <whistles> Nightmare. And in the, her, Nightmare's, Nightmare actually kind of likes the idea of Doctor Strange as uh, Sorcerer Supreme. At least more so than the idea of Baron Mordo as Sorcerer Supreme. Partially because, well, Mordo is more than more than willing to wipe out humanity if it suits his purposes, and if humanity ceases to exist, there is nightmare. Nightmare says that Spider-Man's theory was correct. And Spidey ends up asking Nightmare point blank which religion is right, and. He explains, you know, there's a tale of blind men feeling that feeling elephant. Each touches a different part. The one who touches a trunk says it's a snake. The next touches a leg and says it's a tree trunk, and so forth. And I, so Nightmare says, they're all right and they're all wrong. Religion is blind men touching God. Imagination is purest form. However, Nightmare is caught on to what's going on with Spider-Man. That it's not Spidey using control. It's the costume. And Nightmare tries to tempt the costume to basically become, well, the new god. Reconstruct the world, but then use it to, but then reconstruct the world, but then use it to rebuild the world in his own image. Make it much better than it current than it is. And so he has to reach it, you know, connect with everything, and back at the sanctum. The word of God has reformed. Mor Mordo says it's impossible. Impossible to have happened. Hobgoblin is like, you destroyed it. So Red Cat suggests that he try to let Mordo try again, but something's countering his, his attempt to destroy it. Something inside the book, which apparently wants out. And Spider-Man, well, controlled by the black costume, leaps out and goes after Hobgoblin, leading to Red Cat running.
Spider the co- Spider Man removes the cloak of levitation off of uh, Hobgoblin, then goes at then goes after him. Mordo goes after after Spider Man, however, and does manage to at least somewhat calm him. And so Hobgoblin's about to make the finishing attack when mid attack he vanishes. And then, Strange returns. Mordo says, of course we come to this. Time for the Ancient One's greatest disciples to finally battle. Let this be the end of it. Of course then, Wong basically does the old symbol on the side of the head thing to Mordo knocking him out. And, uh, when it's all said and done, Doctor Strange does ask Spider-Man a question. How much does Spidey really know about that costume he's wearing? And he explains, you know, apparently he's not, this isn't the first time he's had that brought up. First got Black Cat saying she thinks it's alive, and now, and of course, Strange is like, you know, just asking, you know, nothing to worry about. And so Spider-Man kind of says, you know, maybe you should go see what Black Widow's up to. And uh, Strange has correct him saying, what do you mean Black Cat? We find out that Black Widow is now somehow sitting in a movie theater watching the, the movie North. She thought she was somewhere else, and now she's in a movie. That is where the issue and this particular story miniseries come to their close. But we do get a, a final tease about the symbiote Spider-Man. It, it will return. A rather ominous uh, symbol at the bottom there. Seeing as that we are later after Empire concludes there will be a, a, another Marvel event titled The King in Black focusing on Null. Yeah. Not kind of, not that surprised. Next up, we've got the Free Comic Book Day Spider-Man uh, one-shot. So we got two stories here. The first one uh, focuses on Black Cat and Spider-Man. Um, apparently, a uh, the Vulture is arranging the, the purchase of... Uh, Scrawl fear, fear gas grenades. Um, while Spidey and Black Cat have a little back and forth. With Black Cat alluding to the events of the uh, of their fake Magia wedding from the Black Cat Annual. Black Cat definitely giving Spidey some grief about it. And so the pair go after Vulture with Spidey letting it, explaining a fun fact to Vulture. There are spiders in Australia that eat birds. So Spidey and Black Cat give chase. <clears throat> Cat manages to latch on to his outfit and does something to uh, his wing harness before dropping off. What she's done is set one of the gas grenades in his harness and it goes off all around him. And so, later on, Spidey and Black Cat are sitting on top of, of a house, and Spidey rather pointedly asks what Black Cat's up to. Going on that, you know, explaining that, you know, first she hears a silver sable broke into the Sanctum, the Sanctum Sanctorum. Then he hears that she's at the issue of the FS place. Then Danny Rand 
tells Spider-Man that, uh, she, that Black Cat broke into his building with the Beetle. Then Tony Stark come, comes in on, on a leather wanting to know about it, her. Plus, her crew from the, from the Maggie wedding beat him up back, back when they first met. She explains that, you know, she does things he doesn't like. And he does things that she doesn't like. Namely, shacking up with redheads. Though also, the fact that he's rooming with Boomerang... Like, is kind of a... Really? And she goes on to add that their relationship, their friendship, is a weird balance. And maybe she's running a caper, and maybe those are just coinc all coincidences. But... Peter knows her well enough to know that she's not going to hurt anyone, or not, not anyone who doesn't have it coming. She asks him not to worry about him, though he doesn't add, you know, have you met me? All I do is worry about the people in my life. And she does kind of pointedly ask, you know, <laughs> if she thinks the vulture's going to be okay. Your know, response is just, honestly, who cares? Apparently, though, he, uh, he's freaking out over the thought of cats and spiders that eat birds. And that is where the story ends. Now we get the Venom story. Uh, it basically give, has, uh, Eddie's talk with the Avengers after the Venom 25. Everything that's happened so far, all the pain, all the horror, all the darkness, it's all been leading to this, to him. Null. He was here before us, before the birth of light, before everything. He created the symbiote, losing the living abyss of his kingdom. Billions of years ago, they rose up against him, imprisoned him inside a cage, and now, now he's awake. Carnage gave Eddie a choice between saving his, saving his son, Dylan, or unleashing Null in the universe. And he chose to save his son. And he doomed everyone. Null's coming now. On his way to Earth. So everyone, most of the Avengers, are, they're not happy. Blade face while, I'm saying, while saying, Dear God, Captain Marvel, Starts to ask why, you know, why. Um, Hulk asks, when did he get involved with, it? when Eddie got involved with Elder Gods? You know, first Bruce does it now. Um, Tony accuses Eddie of being negligent. Cat is the one to speak up. But um, Tony does, you know, like, you know, hey, no, 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 I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep going. Eddie made kind of with an entity that can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with a celestial, and at no time did he think that he should maybe that, that Eddie that Eddie think that he should maybe come to the Avengers. Or to anyone. Tony does manage to calm him down. And Eddie, you know, yeah, he doesn't know when Null's gonna arrive, but he knows he'll feel it. And he'll be able to sense it. After Eddie leaves, Iron Man asks Cap, if he really believes everything's going to be okay. And the look on Cap's face doesn't exactly inspire confidence. Afterwards, Eddie's kind of doing a self-pity thing walking in the rain, using using the symbiote as uh, as an umbrella. And as, as Eddie and his other go down an alleyway, suddenly shot in the back with what looks like a repulsor blast. But it's not Iron Man. It is Virus, whom we met in Venom 26. Basically, big fight between Venom and Virus. Um, a sonic cannon manages to 
rip the symbiote, rip the symbiote away off of Eddie. Um, and Virus seriously messes Eddie up. Simeon does what he can to fix him up, but, uh... And they do at least manage to... to send, uh, Virus packing for a minute. Virus explains... Does, however... Does say during all this that Eddie took something from him. Everything, in fact. However, the Simeo basically said, then it basically says, hey, you know, you say we've taken, we've heard you, taken something from you? Consider keeping your life our apology. Then does some more damage, explaining that they have bigger things to worry about than some lunatic in a metal suit. As Virus leaves, he tells Venom to tell Dylan that he said hello. Before getting done with our Sonic Scrambler. And flying away on Goblin Glider. Leaving behind a slightly repainted pumpkin bomb. Eddie's other asks if, well, okay, if that's. He's on a goblin glider. You know, could it be Osborne? Though Eddie explains it no, because Osborne wouldn't hide himself like that. And that is where the story ends. Which brings us to Spider Man Noir, number two. Now, for this one, I'm just going to read the recap page from the beginning. New York City, 1939. In an era of mobsters and monsters, crime and corruption run rampant, through, run rampant through the city streets. For a time, the people were protected by the Spider-Man, a mass vigilante who would climb up walls and swing from webs while branching a Colt 45. After one of the waitresses from the Black Cat nightclub turned up dead, there was a, only a single lead for Private Eye Peter Parker to follow. A cicada gemstone clutched in the dead girl's mitt, which led him to a beautiful museum career, the dead dame's sister, Huma. After a flash attack outside Aunt May's house, Peter and Huma have hit the skies for a globe-trotting adventure to solve the mystery beyond the Skata Stone and the murder of Huma's sister. So, they arrive in London. Um, apparently, the flight was not uh, easy on Peter's stomach. They arrive at a the Savoy Hotel. And they've got to go to a shindig at the embassy, so they got to dress the part. However, there are others watching. There are others watching. They're trying to find an amba a specific ambassador. Not exactly having the best of luck. So they split up. Peter finds an American general peddling, peddling black market silk stockings, Russian diplomat peddling black market caviar, a Swiss physicist peddling black market chocolate, and a British politician peddling, well, the war ahead. The British politician is very clearly Churchill. But Peter does manage to, well, Huma manages to find her contact, and Peter finds her. her Peter talks with the contact, and the two watching from outside make a play for the cicada stone once it, once it pops up. Peter masks up and goes after the thieves, and it's just about to catch him. He's got him. One the thief, well, at least one of the thieves, when he runs into a, a London phone booth. However, when Peter slams into the phone booth itself, it's empty. So, they take a boat to, uh... off the, uh, to uh, somewhere on the Sicilian coast. 
where they meet their pilot, who's going to get them into uh, Harry, who's going to get them into uh, into Germany. They had dinner, and then afterwards they get ready to leave. But once again, they're well, they're attacked, but they manage to avoid to evade the attack before arriving in Germany in Berlin. Huma and Peter make their way in, where they find the the uh, doctor that Huma supposed to, was that Huma was waiting on in New York, Doctor Heinrich Hellstrom, dead. A sudden flash of light, however, an Electro has, makes his appearance, and that is where the issue ends. Which brings us to the video's final book, our, our final book for this, video, for this video, Iron Man 2020, number five. So where we left off, Mark I had been seemingly knocked out. However, his personality was still somewhat active on the 13th floor, and various aspects of his personality all came together, and they basically brought themselves back together as Tony Stark, with the help of his old, the old AI Friday. Meanwhile, Arno Stark, Tony's brother, has uh, decided that rather than control the world's AIs, it would be far more easier to prevent the destruction of the world from the extinction entity for him to, if he just you know took over the minds of all humans on the planet <laughs> so we start off with Arno talking about his life and everything he's planning to do everything, everything he's got to go through um, the AI Replace that he that Arno has made to replace Sunset Bane is an entirely doesn't think this is the best course of action. But well, since she's an AI, she won't be affected by by the device he's got. On the thirteenth floor, however, Tony's rebuilding armor and. Uh, Friday gets status updates from everyone. Machine Smith and Herbie, Machine Smith, Herbie and Awesome Andy are ready, are ready to kick some ass. Bethany and Res, Bethany Cave and Rescue have the DNA samples, everything needed to regrow, regrow Tony's missing bits. Andy Bang is there with Machine Manager Costa. They're confident that they can combine all of that and Mr. Stark into one glorious whole. But they need biotubes, which means they need to access Dark Unlimited, or, well, as it's now known, Baytronics. But Friday explains that uh, they've got someone on the inside. So, that's Dark Unlimited. Sun the AI Sunset Bane is looking at the uh, biotube that holds her body in stasis. And, and basically, you know, the greatest idea, you know what sense the greatest idea ever was? The persona that made her rich. The villains who struck fear to Avengers and machine men alike. Madame Menace. Saying that Madame Menace never put up with competition. And so she destroys the biotube that has her, that she was, in, that she was inside. Cat runs off, hits a few, hits a few button, hits the master controls, and Sunset realizes it wasn't just, it wasn't a trick. Cat really is a genius. Apparently, all the security systems are down and the emergency doors are opening. And the AI revolutionaries and their allies burst in. Big fight between the group. 
Dr. Shapiro, the cat, gets his uh, vocal collar back before and explains that you know Sunset Bane blew one or more of them up. The uh, the obedience OS is uploaded into Sunset system. And Jocasta then orders Sunset to order her men to stand down, and then explains that uh, Sunset can dance for her. Not ballet, though. Perhaps the robot. Then, later, they've got Mark One's body in a biotube, and from the 13th floor, in walks the hologram of Tony Stark. And he then merges with the body. And Herbie does kind of point out that uh, Arnold's got kind of a head, big, a really big head start on the revolution. So, and we, so we catch up with Arno at the Stark Space Station where he's installing the mind control device. And the elevator dings, and out comes Tony Stark and his allies. This 13th floor tech can reach the... can reach the space station. Arno goes after Tony, saying that it seems that uh, Tony left his armor at home. But, well... Holographic armor. The only hologra solid hol hologram, virtual armor. The only limit it has is his imagination. Friday informs him that uh, everything, you know, armor's working great, and every weapon, weapon system he can think of is online. But uh, since Arno's family, this Tony feels this requires a personal touch, and so he just you know resorts to fisticuffs. Asking if uh, Arno ever designed something that uh, he knew was obsolete before he was even done. And Tony explains that uh, he has, and well, Arno's wearing it. However, the beating from Tony has actually got has left has actually positioned. Are in the perfect position to flip the switch. However, an alarm goes off. The singularity arrives. With uh, Arno saying that every moment of 2020 was borrowed time, and now time's up. That's where the issue ends. Got one more issue of uh, Iron Man 2020 to go, and the story will be complete. And that. And that's going to do it for this video. As always, feel free to like, share, and subscribe. Links to my Facebook, Twitter, Patreon, and PayPal can be found in the description box down below. This is Rock and Roll Spock signing off, saying live long and rock hard.